Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded by me, Leah Miller, he, him, he is a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Love, Rinse, Repeat is recorded on the unceded sovereign lands of the Gay Omago people and is supported by the vital leadership pathways of the Uniting Church Synod of New South Wales at ACT. Thanks for the support. My guest today is Ewan Lowe. Ewan, welcome along. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really exciting to have you. So for those who don't know, uh, Ewan is the uh, Senior Lecturer in Biblical Studies at Alpha Crucis College and is the Program Director there of, the master, of their Master of Theology. Uh, and his, uh, we're going to be talking Revelation today and, his, uh, and, and post-colonialism and a bunch of other stuff <laughs> related to Biblical Studies. And his dissertation title, for those interested, was Revelation as Drama, Reading and Interpreting Revelation Through the Lens of Greco-Roman Performance, which was completed in 27, uh, 2017. <laughs> So I guess you and how, like, you know, revelation, I mean, that, that's, the, you know, it's a choice, let's say, you know, like, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of baggage. Yes. Uh, it's got a lot of interest. Um, it's got a lot of, you know, uh, <laughs> movies that have got some fascination with it. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting book. So what got you to go, this is where I want to spend several years of my life <laughs> thinking about living in, reflecting on and hopefully producing something that that guides folks into it so um yeah what what got you started as that as the kind of I mean, a, a, an area of kind of uh, speciality oh i mean it's funny right because when when i do um when, when i speak to revelation scholars um i always ask them the exact same question <laughs> because it, it, it is uh, as you say it, it is a choice right it's kind of like like do you really want to do that you know? it's funny like when i tell people what my doctoral work is is in everyone sort of goes oh okay and then you know it makes it really awkward at dinner parties and, and no follow you know, yeah yeah exactly yeah. cool let's talk about something else now um, but you know i think like a lot of people for me um it, it comes out of that fascination of you know um growing up pentecostal which is a big part of this i i, I you know we, we moved to Australia when I was 12. Um, we entered the Pentecostal church, um, you know, became part of the community. Uh, we weren't Christians, so we became Christians in a Pentecostal church. And this was in sort of 2001, right? So just mm. after Y2K, just after all of that. And people were still really spellbound, I think is the right. <laughs> I use that word deliberately, but people were still sort of spellbound by this idea that you, you could use Revelation to predict the future because it was mm. so visceral. Um, you know, there's so much imagery in it, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, it was kind of, you know, growing up in this, um, not really a pressure cooker, but in this little sort of, you know, pot, melting pot, if you like, of mm. these kind of thoughts. And then, you know, I, I went to, ended up going to um, theological college at Whitley, um, you know, Baptist college, and, you know, sort of had my perspectives jammed open a little bit, mm -hmm. um, which is really good. Um, and, and kind of from the moment I took my first New Testament class, I kind of went, well, there's something about Rev that doesn't sit right for me. Hmm. You know, if we've got all these other things that I've now learned about that you can bring to bear on the text, it strikes me that, you know, the way that people read Rev is very narrow and short-sighted and what hmm. have you. But then there was that kind of element of popular culture and popular discourse that you kind of talked about, right? Where I go, wow, a lot of people, it's not just Christians who are doing this. Mm. it's everyone like you know the four horsemen and you know people are like oh revelations here it comes you know um we saw a lot of that in the last couple of years as well mm. and, and so i just went look i really want to get to the bottom of this um mm. and and you know you, when you're training you know in your undergrad you learn all the bi biblical critis critical methods or criticisms and for me i was kind of like look all of this is fine but i don't really see how this works you know mm when applied to Rev, like I can see how you're drawing out bits and pieces here, but nothing really clicked for me until one day, um, Keith Dyer, who went on to be my supervisor, who is a you know fairly well-known figure in um, kind of Baptist academia down here. Certainly he, I remember it was almost like he did it off, not like as an offhanded comment or, you know, for the sake of completion or something, but he was like, oh, you know, and, and some people have tried to interpret it as a performance or drama, um, you know, not many, a couple of people and, all right, well, you know, that could be one way of doing it. Let's move on. And it, that was kind of like the lightning bolt in my head. And I went, that's it. You know, if, if it's a performance, if it's, um, or, or, you know, in our parlance, a movie, shall mm. we say, I go, okay, well, performances are 
deliberately big and bold and mm. over the top. You know, they're full of imagery. But the beautiful thing about them is that they, no one comes to, you know, if you take five different people to see like, I don't know, Hamilton or something, they all come up with diff slightly different interpretations and understandings of it. Mm. And that's okay, mm. right? And so it is an, a piece of art rather than a piece of, not that literature isn't art, but you know, we, yeah, we don't yeah, treat yeah. it in quite the same way. And so mm. that was when it all kind of came alight for me. And I just started going into that rabbit hole really and went, okay, well, I need to know more about this. And yeah, I ended up doing a doctorate. Um, <laughs> and as you know, that, that took up a lot of time and yeah, I'm, I'm, mm. you know, it never ends. I'm still going with it. Yeah, yeah. So I guess as you then started to like, you know, pick out these threads of, of, of drama and performance, um, was it with anything particularly that like was like, oh, that's a really like groundbreaking shift of like how I've seen so much of this particular passage or, or just even a, a broader motif changed for you in that way, in a way that was a real like, like I'm sure like it's a million little changes and big changes. Um, you know, you know, as you say, you know, it, it sustained the whole project. So, but like, were there, were there ones that started to emerge that kind of surprised you particularly with how they helped like elucidate some of the particularly the stuff that often gets so uh, squirrely in popular conception? I, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I don't think there was any big, it was all like kind of little incremental mm. changes more so for me, because I mean, you know, you, you spend years sitting in it and you look yeah. back and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm really different from where, where I was when I started. Um, and I don't know how I got here kind of thing. Um, but, you know, there are a few things that always stand out to me and I try and kind of emphasize when I'm talking to people about Rev. Um, a really classic one that I think the kind of the rhetorical criticism guys, you know, we talk about orality mm -hmm. and stuff highlight, but I think is really, really jarring and obvious um, when you're, you're performing it. There's two, actually. The first one is when it says, here's the lion of the tribe of Judah and you look and it's a lamb and it's like, well, hold on a sec, you know, like if, if you're just saying it, that's already jarring. But imagine, you know, if you're building that image in your mind of like this lion who's like, you know, and, and then suddenly it's, oh, here's a lamb that, you know, is cut open essentially. Mm. Well, what do you do with that? You know, it, it, it literally turns what you're, what you're thinking on its head as you're going through it. And, and it's that whole, you know, the kingdom of God is not as it seems, you know, type thing. And the other one is obviously, um, you know, when it goes, you know, here, here come the 144,000, you know, 12,000 from this tribe, this tribe, this tribe. And then I turned and I saw an uncountable multitude from all tribes and, you know, nations and things. And I go to people, look, Revelation is actually a lot more inclusive than people suspect it is mm. when it comes to that sort of stuff. Um, one of the things that I've been really challenged with recently in thinking through, um, particularly feminist um, approaches to the text has been this idea of, you know, who is Jesus, right, in the text? And, and what, what is Jesus's appearance? Because it shifts mm. from moment to moment in the text. You see one like the son of man, like a son of man, but he's really clearly not human, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, and then he shifts into a lion and he shifts into a lamb and, and he's got this very mutable body. And mm. I go, wow, that's got very interesting implications for our Christology and how we, we deal with this question of what does Christ look like, you know, mm. coming out of the um, um, feminist Christology seminar yeah. that you know we're both at. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. So I guess it's, it's interesting because I think the first time we, we met uh, for the first time at the uh, Things That Make for Peace conference, uh, which was an interfaith, or, or at least a di Christian Islamic dialogue around uh, yeah, peacemaking in, in various traditions. And, and you presented on, on, on Revelation there, which I guess you know, that also must get the occasional look if you're like um, when you're sending in that <laughs> abstract of, I want to talk about peacemaking and, and I'm going to be focusing on Revelation. But again, I think from what I remember of it, that, that, that part of what it, it was, it was about that this kind of inclusivity of the holy city uh, and and those who come to it um but I guess I remember one part which was and I, I guess I'm curious about this in terms of like that kind of led to I think if I remember right a suggestion of authorship that mm -hmm. there's a sense of a a rather Jewish Christianity um within this image of the uh, other nations coming in 
bringing what they have, but not necessarily staying or changing, uh, uh, you know, and, and moving through. So I'm curious a bit about, um, yeah, both both this sense of the this inclusivity that you just mentioned, um, and and how maybe we're thinking about, you know, by whom and for whom, mm. the 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 drama was written. Because you know, if you sit down to write a drama, you're someone's doing it, and that's an important question. And they usually have an audience in mind. Um, and and so yeah, I'm curious how that kind of shapes a bit of what you're thinking here. Yeah. Um... I've been thinking a lot about this recently as well, and and where I've kind of landed at the moment, <laughs> caveat there, as you know, <laughs> biblical scholars, you know, we we will change our mind, hopefully, but mm -hmm. based on the evidence we find. Um, at the moment, I, I kind of like a later date for Revelation. Um, so, you know, kind of Domitian era, probably, which places it, you know, anywhere in the 80s to the 90s, um, mm -hmm. in the first century CE. I do think it is a, a, a sect of Judaism, um, you know, Joe and I community or not are up to you, I say. I, I like the idea because it's neat and it solves <laughs> some problems. It, I mean, it, it, it creates other problems, but, you know, um, but I kind of go, look, in my mind, what you have is a, a group of people who have been self-alienated. I, I, I think I really have to say that from the Jewish community that they come out of. Mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of diaspora anyway, you know, so you know, anyone who has migrated or, or moved, changed their social location knows that you, that's already a traumatic mm. experience. You know, you, you move from one place to another or you're, you're cut off or you're separated from your original culture, whatever that means. Um, so, you know, there's a tendency to try and hold on to the traditions of the past, yeah. the customs, because that defines your identity, right? Who you are. So these this group of diaspora people and then suffering through the loss of the temple and asking what that means right you know what mm. what do we do when we can't worship god in the same way that our ancestors have done for generations then you've got within that this group of christians who are like hey guess what we don't need to do any of that <laughs> you know we're we're christians now we hooray we we do our own thing mm. um and obviously the jews are not happy about that i mean you no one would be you know in in today's political parlance, you might say, oh, that's un-Australian, you know, that, that kind mm -hmm. of language that gets thrown around a lot to other people. And I think there's a, a purpose and a reason behind that. But anyway, so, so then in Revelation, I think you've got this Christian community who feel like they're being cut off from the Jewish community because mm -hmm. they are trying to be different from Judaism. Um, and at the same time, they feel like they're being persecuted for their religious beliefs. And Part of that is, you know, the, the changing Roman um, restrictions on Judaism, right? Um, and, and Domitian, you know, as, as you we um, know now, um, you know, um, altered some of the, the things like, you know, the Jewish tax and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, and the legal status of Judaism as a religion, you know, is possibly under siege here. So for the Jews, they have to protect themselves and their traditions. So, and, and you know, they're... They have to, um, how do you say, avoid scrutiny from the authorities, right? Because it's, a, it's it, you know, they've just been smashed by the Roman military. No one wants it to happen again. So they're like, okay, well, we've got to cut these Christians out because they're causing trouble. Christians are like, well, the Jews hate us. The, the Romans hate us. Everyone hates us. So that sucks. Um, yep, what are we going to do? And, and, and so I think you have this community who are feeling like they're they're under siege basically mm. whether or not they actually are i don't think that's as important to be honest i think a lot of it is psychological mm -hmm. and, and they well if you feel persecuted you act accordingly and i think mm. you know that there's a fair bit of, of um kind of anthropological study that shows this now so john then i think is writing and whether you want to you want to believe that he had a vision of this or not he writes to these people and, mm. and for me this is where that post-colonial thing comes in right? That question of why does John do this? Mm. Well, there's a number of reasons. I think the number one is to give hope to these people and show them that, you know, as cliche as it sounds, God has got a plan for them, right? That they, their beliefs and their ideas and, you know, the identity and all of that is still to be found in their worship. Uh, and that's still important. And, but also in the face of the kind of totalitarian, um, authoritarian, hegemony that they find themselves facing that god is in control and that they can find ways to resist him uh, sorry to resist the emperor and the empire and the idolatry that they're seeing um, and navigate that path 
And, and, and you know, it's interesting because that's where the Jewishness of this comes back in as well. Because John's kind of going, yeah, you know, we may be separated from the Jews, but we're still Jewish. You know, we're, we're still mm. deeply, distinctly rooted in Judaism. I mean, for goodness sakes, you know, um, the, the foundations of the holy city are, are the tribes of Israel, you know. Mm. Um, he still talks in terms of those language, that language. So people who say Revelation's anti-Semitic, I think, haven't really read the text carefully. Uh, you could construct an argument that way. I think it is a flawed one. Mm. Um, so, yeah, um, John is trying to, to galvanize his community, I guess, and use strategies to help them to cope with this disconnect with these traumatic feelings that they're, they're feeling. Um, but at the same time, I think encouraging them to continue in the good fight, as it were, and stay faithful um, to what they believe in without, you know, um, drawing undue attention to themselves because of the danger of the Roman military. Does that kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's all very, together? very helpful. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, so you mentioned uh, post-coloniality or post-colonialism there. Um, and so, you know, you went through Whitley, which I know that's a big, um, you know, um, the word aspect i don't know lens through which the uh the, their, their academic work is engaged um was that something you knew going into whitley that you were like i want to no okay i'm seeing a shake of the head a big surprise so i guess i'm curious about your your introduction to it what it kind of brought up for you and then how that maybe shapes how you think about now teaching it again probably to a lot of people who come in not knowing anything about it not expecting it um you know and, and you know and maybe we can get into how that how you might encourage others to think about how we introduce these things that often are a shock to people but are you know vital especially in when doing biblical studies and theologies in in you know the lands now called australia so but we can start more with your own kind of journey in and we'll, we'll push out in that direction yeah i mean it's funny right because i was in a pentecostal church um mm -hmm. i still am no one knew anything about baptist colleges right <laughs> so it was kind of like oh well Go, I'm going to this college and people, I mean, you know, and, and I don't want to, you know, slag off Pentecostalism here, but up to, even up till recently, and I think it is changing now, there was a bit of the anti-intellectual bias in Pentecostalism. It, look, it's well-documented. We all know it. Um, you know, that, that's, I think, a, a uh, historical thing yep. rather than a, well, I mean, <laughs> you, you can take it however you want as an agenda, if you want to take it as an agenda, but it, is, it does have historical roots. Um, so people were sort of like, oh, look, be careful of going to Bible college. It'll deconstruct your faith, blah, 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 whatever. Cool. Um, and then you sit in a class with Mark Brett. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, Mark is just this amazingly brilliant mind. Mm. But he talks like four levels above where most people are. And, and when he tones it down, he's still three levels above everyone else. <laughs> so I remember sitting in, in intro to Hebrew Bible just being like, what have I done? you know um but then over time kind of listening to him you know reading his writing speaking with some of the others Keith was really good with it as well um I under I came to understand it right and I don't think anyone who tells you they've got post-colonialism probably you know hasn't <laughs> I don't think you can get it. It, it it's a process yeah. um but it really helped me because it as a kind of 1.5 generation immigrant especially it helped me a lot with, and, and, and someone who grew up in a colonized country that, that was unpicking that. So I grew up in Malaysia. Um, you know, my grandfather worked in the civil services under the British, and he'd talk about it all the time. You know, it was a big part of his identity, you know. Um, and it's funny, you know, whenever he, whenever he met white people, including white people who had married into our family, he would salute them. Mm. And that was just just a, just one of those little quirks, right? And you're like, oh yeah, you know, you could say, oh, that's just grandpa. And you go, oh well, no, that's that's the effect of colonialism, right? Mm. Um, anyway, so 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 setting and and obviously Japanese colonialism before that or mm. around that time as well. So you kind of this country kind of navigates both of these. Anyway, so I come to Australia, you know, how do you act as an immigrant, whatever? Um, but learning about post-colonialism really helped me to come to grips with my identity and, and who I was and how I had been shaped, mm. you know, as reactions against reactions against reactions. And so I think, you know, it can be really helpful for people who are trying to understand that. Um, 
I, it's funny, right? I'm, I'm writing my monograph, um, which will be, well, I don't know when it'll be published, hopefully in a couple of years, but I'm kind of going through it now. And, and one of the critiques I make of post-colonialism is that it has become a little bit ivory tower academ academic. You know, a lot of the post-colonial thinkers, um, we're not writing to people who need post-colonialism, we're writing to each other, mm. which is the, 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 the tragic irony of it. But I make this comment, I go, look, the people who care about post-colonialism are the ones who are educated to the level where we're able to recognize the effects of colonialism on us and unpick that. You know, not, not saying people, not saying that education, you know, distinguishes us, but I'm saying it, it gives us the tools to undo that. Mm. And so we all have identity crises and then we turn to post-colonialism. So <laughs> it's just every, basically what, what I say is, you know, post-colonialism at the moment is, you know, immigrants, third culture kids um, wrestling with their identities in the guise of academia. And hopefully it, it's helpful for other people as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you want me to talk a little bit about like what it is? Because I, I feel like we've talked around, around this term a yeah, lot. Yeah, let's, let's go there. Yeah. Maybe, that, yeah. maybe like a quick definition. Yeah. Um, to help everyone. So it's immensely complex, but I like what um, Sugi Tharaja, um, or Sugi as he's known, says about post-colonialism, which is basically an attitude of deconstruction that asks questions about power relations um, and uneven power relations and how they're negotiated by different groups. That's, that's like the biggest, easiest way to oversimplify <laughs> yeah, it, I think. Yeah. Um, but it is helpful. Um, and, and, and it asks questions about how groups exercise power and dominion and hegemony um, over other groups. Um, and, and usually, well, it begins with this question of colonialism, right? When, when one group comes in and asserts power over another group, um, it fractures that other group's society and, and the way they do life. Um, you know, I already hinted at that with my that story about my grandfather. Yeah. And... And you know how what, what happens through this, and what happens when the colonizers leave, or mm. we enter a, a, a space where you know the, the colonized people are able to start thinking through the effects of that. How do we unpick? Can we unpick you know the effects of colonialism on our lives, mm. and and how do we come to terms with it? I guess so. So that's kind of the the overarching broad question here. When, when applied to the biblical texts, I think you find very interesting results where, you know, we, we can look through the biblical texts and, and talk about how the biblical texts themselves are unhelpful and show evidence of colonial mindsets, you know, of domination, of going, well, um, God's given you this land, go and kill whoever you want, have fun, it's all yours, you know, and, and, and the lasting effects of that being brought into Western traditions Western um, countries, I, I suppose I should say, who use that as justification for their actions. But we also detect within the text strands that oppose that. Mm. You know, how do we unpick or, or, or fight, um, resist colonialism, I should say. Um, you know, resistance studies is kind of a subgroup, but not, you know, it kind of sits or has an awkward tension with post-colonialism. So it's, it's asking those questions of, you know, how do, for me, it's, it's because of where I've come from, a lot of my thinking has been around, you know, how does the text help me to resist colonial measures, um, or at least, you know, ask questions about them. But there is also the element of, you know, how do we, how do we deal with it um, and its corroding effects? And, and do we run the risk of becoming colonizers ourselves? And I think Revelation kind of encapsulates that tension beautifully. Um, you know, um, one of the lasting critiques that I think post-colonials talk about with Revelation is the fact that Revelation mimics, um, it, pretend, it, it presents this picture of God in his throne room, and it looks a lot like the emperor's throne room. Is that good or bad? You know, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the real question. And it's like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. You know, mm. it, it's good because it shows that God is in control and more powerful than the emperor. But if God looks like the emperor, does that mean that we should then imitate the ways of the Roman Empire, mm. you know, and, and that's just what life looks like now, mm. you know, when, and, and so the, the, the critique is, and I don't know if it's a fair critique, I don't think it is, but 
but the, the critique is, you know, when Christianity becomes the state religion of Rome, that's exactly what happens. Everything just flips and you go, great, you know, we're in charge now. We're going to do the exact same thing as the colonizers, you know, and, and you know, yeah. so colonialism um, replicates itself. Mm, mm. I think it's helpful, um, as you said, when you point out that idea of this, this post-colonialism being this kind of this attitude or a stance, um, because people kind of talk about like, you know, like it's one thing in like, say, like a India or a Vietnam, which, you know, is in a kind of post-colonial era in the sense of there was a colonial power who have, were no longer there and now they're doing that unpicking and people then wrestle with, well, what about here uh, in the lands now called Australia, where it's, you know, it, it's not post-colonial in the same sense, but, but as you say, you can still approach things and think from a post-colonial stance uh, because it is about that like that unpicking um mm. and that that wrestling with without it necessarily needing to um only exist within particular um socio-political um structures um, yeah yeah and, and and funnily enough you know i was just chatting to one of my students before um this we, we recorded this and what I was saying to him was, you know, in my view, and I, I'm happy to be challenged and, and, and kind of called out on this, but in my view, things like post-colonialism, you know, liberation, hermeneutics, feminism, we're using the same, maybe not the same tools, but we're using similar approaches. It's just mm. that our foci are a little bit different mm. from each other. At the end of the day, we are asking questions about how we unpick unequal power structures. Yeah. And it's just that one happens to be more focused on gender or you know mm -hmm. ethnicity or or, or uh, money or, or economics or, or you know um politics so so i think that a lot of these ways of thinking and that's why i find you know still use idea that these are critical attitudes mm. because then it, it makes life really difficult as an academic because you don't have a method right you don't have a critical methodology you can't define what you're doing necessarily but it's really helpful at the same time because it means that, like you say, in this place that we call Australia, you know, I, I'm here on Wurundjeri country, I can ask similar questions and, but not be pigeonholed mm -hmm. into the same sort of structures as someone who might be asking questions in, as you say, you know, South Africa or India or whatever. And that's one of the beauties of it, that it allows, it allows contextualization, which is, you know, so important. Mm. So I'm thinking about now as you're as you're teaching, as your as this shapes your work and, and interaction with students and or interactions in your church or different places. Like, you know, it's often you know there's that kind of thing of you know you've got to go jet, gently with folks sometimes. You know, um, there's no really prizes for being you know perfectly virtuous in your theory if if you know everyone dislikes you or no one listens. Um, so so how have you found trying to like, I guess, you know, and, and as you've learned from the way you engaged with previous teachers, think about how you engage, you know, not just post-colonialism, but I guess, you know, feminism, uh, feminist theology and biblical studies and liberation hermeneutics and introduce those. Have you found there are particular ways that you found, oh, this was more, fruit, this has been more fruitful, you know, or I've tried this and I realized really quickly walls went up and it, it, it delayed the process, you know, X amount of weeks or months, if I, but if I tried this, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you've had anything or whether it's just always you just have to read the room and feel what's feel what's there i mean there's a bit of that always um yep. like i say you know the people who are attracted to particular methods or or, or critical approaches are people well, again you know we, we say i'm going to say the same thing and i don't mean this facetiously at all but you know, a lot of the critical methods that re resonate with us resonate with us because we've got trauma or injuries or, you know, questions about our identity, right? Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, um, for me as a someone who grew up with colonialism, I'm attracted to post-colonial theory. So I can kind of, mm. you know, maybe predict a little bit people who are going to be more interested in it. Yep. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's not for white people, right? Not at all. But but in my experience, mm -hmm. no, I, it tends to be people like me who are first, second generation immigrants who are asking these questions about it and we, who are, are going to find it very useful. Mm -hmm. um, having said all that, what I found in terms of teaching at a more, um, you know, um, conservative uh, institution, um, you know, where, where, you know, saying these words 
is going to put people offside almost immediately, like feminism or, or whatever. What I tend to do, and, and this isn't a, a, a <laughs> this isn't you know me trying to infiltrate the the dogma of you know <laughs> critical race theory or what or so, any of that you know those straw man arguments that are really fallacious into it. But it is I, I just come back and I say, look, let's look at Jesus, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and and you know it sounds so simple, but it really is right with with, with students like well, all right, let's explore these questions about people like Jesus. Let's draw in some context. And let's see where we end up with that, you know. Mm. Um, the, 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 the basic one I always do with people is I go, okay, well, here's an interaction of Jesus with um, some of the, the Jewish leaders, and they bring him a denarius, and they say, you know, well, what do we do? And, and he goes, well, whose head is on the coin, and what does it say? And, you know, and that's a clear statement. Once you show them what the coin says, you know, son of God, emperor, august one, you know, venerable father of the fatherland, chief high priest, it's very obvious that there is a political contest happening there. And, and that's my way of kind of bringing, introducing students to this idea that Jesus is interested in destabilizing systems, right? And it's uncomfortable. But the more, I think once you're able to show people a couple of those stories mm -hmm. and, and get them to start thinking about it, it takes weeks, by the way, you know, people have to grapple with this stuff. But once you start seeing it, you can't unsee it. Mm. And that, well, that was my experience, you know, um, sitting with Mark, sitting with Keith, um, you know, Ross Langmead, God bless, um, you know, rest in peace, um, you know, <clears throat> thinking through these things and going, wow, yeah, actually, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, power plays and, you know, politics and, you know, whatever you want to call it going on here. That's, that's important because that's, that affects how we live our lives today. If you if you truly believe in this text and want to live your life by it, which you know many um, conservative, well, not just conservative, but many Christians or people who would call themselves Christians, I hope would do, um, with its flaws and faults. But it's going, you know, yeah, it, it it has to mean something. And if you've been reading it in a shallow way your whole life, that's not necessarily on you, mm. I don't think. But once you've learned that there is an alternative then I think it is on you to try and broaden your mind and expand your horizons a little bit. I mean, another classic one that is quite complex, to be honest, but I really enjoy doing is um, the, the little sequence in Luke where, you know, Jesus meets Zacchaeus and then he's, he, he tells the story of um, the king who goes off for a distant country to claim power for himself, the parable of the, I think it's, it's talents in that one, I'm pretty sure, or is it Minas? It's different in Matthew. Um, and then the, the the story of him clearing up the temple, and you know when you when you unpick some of the historical context behind that, and realize that these are stories about money, and and the use of money, you know students go, oh my gosh, that, that's that's a whole that's the whole chapter, that's all of Luke nineteen, mm. that is Jesus talking about how you know the way that um, money is exercised is a corrupting influence. Um, and, and, you know, money is a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. But even then, the way we use it, we need to be very careful about. Mm. So, so by doing these kinds of exercises, I find um, from there, students, are, you know, you don't want to push people into things that they are not interested in. Um, and so, you know, the students who are then interested in this will make themselves known, I guess. And then you kind of take them on that journey with you. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. That's really... Uh... That's really helpful. So you have a, uh, a podcast, uh, which is on, I guess, a, something of a hiatus at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. called Unveiling Apocalypse, which is all about conversations about uh, the book of Revelation with, uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess, various friends and colleagues and, and other scholars. Um, I guess, how, have you, how did you find that process as you were doing it? And I guess, you know, how do you, you know, do kind of with swinging back around Revelation, but I mm -hmm. guess probably what you're finding there is like, as you said before, there are these lots of different approaches, right? That, as you say, might just be slightly privileging or, or centering one particular mode of analysis or, 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 or societal structural um, unequal dynamic. Um, how did how did those conversations, as I guess a microcosm of your broader life in this world, um, how is that making you think about the broader like world of revelation studies 
like, you know, and what, what are some of the really interesting things that you're seeing going on and, and how does that help, you know, you know, what should we, what should folks be excited about that they might find out about someday <laughs> <laughs> or, or if they listen to your podcast? <laughs> yeah. Um, look, it's interesting that, you know, um, almost everyone I speak, well, everyone I've spoken to so far in, in the podcast, and I know, you know, Revelation scholarship is fairly small. There's not a lot of us, um, you know, so eventually you all know each other, but <laughs> It's interesting that everyone comes at it slightly differently, as you say, and, and come from different places, but end up in roughly the same place. Mm. Um, and, and we all go, okay, well, it's not about what we thought it was. And almost everyone ends up saying, well, it is about hope mm. rather than about fear. And that's one thing that's really, I guess, in 2020 and 2021 really upset me about the the, the way that the book was being used in popular discourse and wider Christian mm. circles is people are leveraging it for fear. And I go, that is the exact opposite mm. of what the book's about, you know? Um, for me, it's been a journey of, you know, learning, yeah, I mean, um, reading everyone's, you know, um, methods and approaches and things. For me, one of the big struggles, or not struggles, but learnings, I guess, has been asking the question about agency in Revelation. Mm. And, and going, you know, in light of all the, the context stuff that we talked about, you know, the situation of the audience, I've kind of come to a place where I go, well, Revelation, even though it opposes empire very strongly and opposes, you know, um, evil practices and corrupting practices, it also doesn't, it calls people to resist. Yes. And I think nowadays, Revelation studies has swung almost completely in that direction where or I'd say 90% of scholars would say, yep, it's, it's resistance literature about the Roman empire. But for me, when I read the text, I go, well, it, it does call us to resist, but it's also very careful about how it does that. It isn't saying go out and stab people. It isn't saying, you know, let's, let's lead an armed revolt against, you know, the Roman empire because Jerusalem, I mean, if you dared it where I did it, Jerusalem's just been smashed 10 years ago. Everyone's still recovering from that. Instead, it calls the, its readers, uh, or audio, or I shouldn't say readers, uh, its hearers, its audience, to do three things. I, I narrow it down to three things. My colleague John has seven. I think three is neater. <laughs> we argue about it all the time. <laughs> um, um, but I think very Baptist, them. like that's that's showing you're like, you know, you're exactly. You <laughs> well, that's right. You know, it's funny. I, I, I'm what we call a Bapticostal, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, three mm. things which are weight, witness and worship. And I go, well, outside of that, Christians aren't really called to do much. Yes, there's an ethic of non-participation, mm -hmm. but that I think comes under worship, you know, and, and mm. not idolizing particular things. Um, whether it's corrupt practices, whether it's, you know, God emperors um, or, or humans who set themselves as God emperors, um, cults, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and worship continues to be a central part of, of this community story of going, well, yes, things are out of your control. Yes, the world is, you know, <laughs> seemingly descending into hell. Uh, sounds familiar to many people right now. Um, but at the end of the day, God's in control. And what you need to do is keep reminding everyone of the fact that God is in control, that as a community, you look after each other and you keep waiting for God, you keep witnessing about God and you keep worshiping God. Mm -hmm. And if you do the, these three things, fine, you know, you, you'll be right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting that there is no real, there, there is an ethic of self-protection insofar as it, it's like, well, let's not attract the attention of the authorities by, you know, again, violently resisting or what have you. But at the same time, martyrdom is one of those things that are like, cool, if we die, we die, it's all good. So I think there is a radical refocusing. And look, this is all the way through the New Testament anyway, but it's worth re repeating because people forget this. There is a radical refocusing away from the self and onto the community mm. and going, well, some of you may die, <laughs> yes, um, in service to the community. But at the end of the day, you know, as long as the community abides and is able to keep pointing towards God, that's good. Mm. Now, I don't want this to be misinterpreted either, you know, in, in the context of the debate we're currently having 
about you know what does it mean to live with COVID and all that. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying mm-hmm. you know egalitarianism rules by any means because I think Jesus makes it really clear that he is willing to drop 99 and go for one, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But but this you know revelation is very clearly in terms of this underground persecuted community who who feel like they're um yeah they're beset by challenges all around Mm. they're not in a privileged position these are the they would almost have considered themselves the dregs of society to some extent you know um they're hated by every community around them Mm. but but see this is where revelation then i think becomes very complex and and i i I, i'm very hesitant to posit a right or wrong interpretation because it has these elements and characteristics, people do latch onto it and use it to justify what they're doing. They go, oh, well, you know, we are anti-science or, or flat earthers or whatever. We are a persecuted minority. The whole world's against us. Um, and so we, we, you know, we do what Revelation says um, and when we rely on this book. And, and yeah, that, that's what it's designed to do. But I think that's where that whole thing of wit- witness weight worship and human agency comes back into it. And I go, well, fine but you're not as the, the the text does appeal to people who feel persecuted but it doesn't call them to go out and fight everyone else mm. you know so, so it's it's navigating those tensions mm. because i'm very very sympathetic to this idea that everyone at different points will read revelation very differently and get different experiences out of it you know that's that's the the double edged sword of art yeah <laughs> right it it becomes its own living thing once you put it out there in the world um, and I think the other thing about it is that you, at different stages in your own life, you will read it differently mm-hmm. and you should read it differently. So it's, it's this, it's, it's um, <laughs> to quote, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, it's not a tame lion. <laughs> mm-hmm. It can't be, you know, you, you, no one ever gets the handle on revelation because it, it does that. It, it pushes back against you. And, and, that's one of the things I love about it, to be honest. But it makes it very difficult in 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 a day and age where we do have these vociferous contests about everything. <laughs> yes. yes. Thanks, Internet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you so much for that. And that's um, yeah, very helpful, as you say, because I, I think um, well, in just even going back to that first point of, of of hope being prominent, and I know I've definitely lent on you know, some of those later chapters of Revelation as, as you know, because the imagery is just so um, sublime as, as, as it begins to paint this picture of, of, of what is to come. And like, there's definitely some, you know, rich hope in, in those in those texts. I think that's nice to know. That's a, a, a central thing for a lot of people of where the, the, the text leads to. Um, and I guess potentially that's also then becomes a bit of a litmus test of, you know, those communities who are seeing themselves persecuted and thus placing them in the text, uh, you know, would you look at them and still say they're somewhat communities of hope or, mm. or, or are they just, you know, um, fear and anger and um, whatever d- divisiveness as, as, mm. as defining them? Um, yeah. That's a, anyway, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I guess, yeah, you, you fit the nail on the head there, but the question really is, you know, do you live in fear or do you live in hope? Mm. Right. And Revelation's audience, I think, are somewhat living in fear, but John calls them the hope. Mm. And, and, you know, today, you know, that, that's the same question we face ourselves, I think. And, and the hard thing about fear is that people don't like to af- admit they're afraid. Mm. Mm. Right. And, and, and the other thing about fear is that people wrestle for control or, or some measures of control or agency to show that they are, to feel like they have some measure of control. And so they don't need to be afraid, Um, which is where that whole, you know, question about vaccinations comes in, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, And and one of the things I've been wanting to say to people, and I haven't quite figured out the right way to say it, is going, you realize that, you know, you're you're, you're telling everyone not to live in fear of a virus, but you're living in fear of a vaccine, you know, not to to get too overly political about it, but why do you do either of those things? Live in Mm -hmm. hope. Mm. You know, live in hope and, 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 you know, you pray every day that God comes back and, you know, the sooner the better, thanks, you know, um, but you, you, you live in hope that your community, you know, will abide and, and, you know, that you can continue to do good and make a difference mm. um, in this evil world. Not, not that the world is evil either, right? I, I think mm. it's, it's 
empires that are evil, but mm. empires dominate. So, so in, in this evil empire dominated world, I should say, yeah. um, that you know you, you can make a difference um, mm. and, and God does hear ultimately mm. your sacrifices. And, and that's one of the beautiful things that comes out of Revelation, you know, that it's just a little phrase, but it's, you know, and the, 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 the blood of the martyrs cry out from under the altar, how long, how long? And God responds and just says a little, just a little longer. And it's going, mm. you know, you, you are suffering. People acknowledge that, but God does hear your cry mm. and he does posture himself to respond. Mm. It just, his timing is very different to yours, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for that. You know, and I think for this whole conversation, it's been, it's been wonderful. We've covered so much that I, I'm, I'm, mm. you know, my reading revelation is richer for it. My oh, thank you. Much is too, and I'm sure it is the case for our audience. Um, anything you want to promote or draw people's attention to as we, I mean, obviously people can keep an eye on the horizon for our monograph appearing at some point um, <laughs> in the mid 2020s, but um, yeah, anything you want to promote or, or draw people's attention to at this moment? Ah, I don't hate self-promotion, but yeah, um, monograph coming up with SBL Press, hopefully in a year or two, we'll see. Um, I, I do have a podcast, as you said, um, called Unveiling Apocalypse. People can have a look at that. It is, as you say, um, on hiatus because I really hate um, recording over Zoom. <laughs> it just doesn't get the quality that I quite like, but that's okay. Um, no, not really. Look, I, I encourage people to just read Revelation. <laughs> you know, like read it, but not read it with with different lenses on, I mm. guess, mm. is my encouragement. Because one of the big things is fear when it comes, ironically, right? Yeah. When it comes to reading Revelation, people are afraid of it because it is dense, it is complex, and it, it has been so radically misrepresented. So go and read it for yourself. Um, or if you can, read it the way the um, ancient world would have read it. That is to say, don't read it, listen to it, you know, um, get an audiobook version or something, give yourself a couple of hours, maybe do it in two sittings. Um, one of my colleagues um, over at Avondale, um, Kale, Kale Deval, suggests that Revelation was always performed in two sittings, uh, which I think is a really interesting way to do it. Um, yeah, you know, cut, carve yourself out an hour either side and yeah. yeah, sit with the text and just let it wash over you and see what happens. Um, mm. Another colleague of mine from Fuller, Peter Perry, he performs Revelation with his students, um, for his students, I should say, and he says that every time he does it, the response is always, well, there, there isn't a uniform response, but the only uniform response he does get is, oh, it isn't quite what I thought it was, and I mm. have to change my idea about what it was, which is yeah. in and of itself excellent. So, mm. you know, don't be afraid to do that, would be my encouragement to everyone listening. That's great. That's a great encouragement. I might do it myself. So that's, no, thank you for that. That's, I really, really, I really like that idea. Well, um, you know, thank you for joining us, uh, folks. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll be back next week. Bye.